Welcome to the underground, you rebel scum. This is the American expat, and I've got an interesting question here. How did you become an expat, and what does that even mean? Well, I am prepared to answer that question today. I'm going to go through the whole sad story. Well, it's not really a sad story exactly, most of it. But, uh, you know, the, the whole way. How did I become the American expat? Whoa! Sorry for my antics once again. Yeah, I grab your favorite drink, pull up a seat, and let's uh, let's get into this whole thing. So my uh, what? First of all, what is an expat? A lot of people hear that and they think, well, man, you know, you don't like your own country, expatriate. No, that's not what it means. It's just a term that's given to people who live abroad. So if you decided to take a job or do something, and you were living in another country, you would be an expat. You would become an American expat. Yourself. I mean, if you're from America, I mean, it depends, you know, what country you're from. But if you're living in a country other than your own, then you're an expat. And so, I, yeah. Anyway, I, uh, my experience with living abroad and expat stuff, it goes all the way back, probably bef long before I ever actually became an expat and lived abroad. I, uh, I was working, well, how, how would I put this? I, uh, now what the heck, I'm, I'm just going to tell you guys the whole, the whole thing off the cuff here, not, um, I, I don't think I'm going to edit anything out of this, but if I do, you'll notice because it'll jump, but, um, I don't plan to edit any of the story. So we go back all the way to when I was 19 years old. I just finished high school and in the way that I was brought up at that time, you go and you serve a mission for your church. Some of you are familiar with this. You'll hear as soon as you hear that, you're going to be like, oh yeah, one of these, uh, I know what you are. Yes, the Mormons. Um, you've probably seen them come knock on your door. Let me adjust this microphone. I was one of those guys on the bikes, except uh, a lot of the time I wasn't half the time I was on a bike. Six months. It's a two-year... That's not half the time. A year. Twelve months. It's a two-year mission. I don't know if it still is. I um, I don't actively go to that church anymore, which is kind of funny considering the amount of time I devoted to convincing other people to go to that church. But, um, yeah, I went on this uh, this mission. And, you know, some people, they uh, the church tells you where they want you to go. You don't get to choose, at least at the time you didn't. I don't know if that's changed. But, uh, anyway, I got my thing in the mail and it said that I was going to California and Long Beach. And I guess I was pretty excited about that. It could have been anywhere in the world. And they chose this uh, this teeny tiny place in California for me to go. And, you know, OK, I, uh, I didn't expect anything different. You know, it's America, whatever. It's going to be a lot of American stuff, kind of what I'm familiar with. It's on the other side of the country. It's not on the other side of the world. But um, anyway, I went there. And ended up serving in all kinds of different uh, cultural, I guess, branches and wards and that sort of thing, which is, you know, just like a geographical organization for the church. Um, my first experience was in a Samoan and, well, no, no, this time it was Tongan. Don't get those two mixed up, believe me. So I ended up serving in this uh, this Tongan ward, which, again, that's like a geographic area for the church. So the people that live in that area go to this particular ward. That was an incredible experience that completely changed the, uh, the direction that my life probably would have been going prior to going on this mission. I, I had very little experience with cultures outside of regular old American stuff, whatever was happening in Virginia at that time. So <clears throat> What, what can I say? I mean, it was just so different. You go to church. Normally, you know, like people sing songs in church. If you've ever been to church, if you go to church, you know what I'm talking about. They'll sing hymns. Well, you know, just going into the church and having the people sing the hymns was like the most beautiful choir you've ever heard. Uh, that wasn't the life-changing part. It was just a great part of it. But the whole culture, you know, like people are wearing different clothes. They're like 
have things on and I, I got to learn this this Pacific Island culture and kind of for a little bit be brought into that culture. And that was the first. The next step, you know, I got to something similar, Samoan culture, another little ward that was uh, Samoan, and uh, also Cambodian. There's a, a large Cambodian community in California, and I got to go and experience that. And prior to this, again, my uh, my experience with other cultures was very limited. I, um, you know, I like uh, anime might have been the only, like anime and kung fu movies. You know, that's my only connection to Asia. So here I am in this uh, this completely alien, uh, I guess, culture. Learning about it is just really fascinating. Everything was fascinating. They'd tell me stories about, you know, black magic and stuff, which they they have all this great stuff. If somebody was a comic book artist or somebody that does like movies, if they heard some of the stories, boy, these things belong in a movie or something, just or a video game, just absolutely incredible. There's all this stuff like you do black magic and, you know, if you do too much of it, then it, it corrupts you or takes over you and your head comes off and... You've got like your entrails dragging around and floats around eating dead stuff. I, I don't know. I can't remember all of it, but there was all this incredible stuff, uh, you know, to experience different kinds of food. And I was fortunate that uh, it turns out that I'm very flexible when it comes to foods that I can handle. Some of the people that I was with, they they couldn't handle the different foods. <laughs> it was always an interesting thing because, you know, in other cultures, sometimes it's very offensive if you don't eat the food that they give you. Uh, especially with some of the Polynesian ones that I was at, the Pacific Islander ones, man, they, they pile it on, you know, and there's all this octopus and fish and stuff. And I had one guy that couldn't handle the taste of fish. So he's like trying to eat it, you know, and they're watching really close to see if he likes it. And he's like trying to uh, wash it down with water and they're like, keep piling it on, you know, it was a great experience, but it was, um, it, it kind of made this connection with me with other parts of the world and kind of opened up my my way of thinking, I guess, about other places and other things. If I had never gone on that mission to, for those two years, I probably would just be in the house all the time playing video games and never do anything at all. Well, anyway, I came back. Things were pretty boring for a while. I worked and went to school, and I uh, there was an exchange student or something that came along, and I, it kind of got me thinking again about it. So I started communicating with people outside of the country, and I learned a little bit about China, and this is a place that I never would have imagined going to prior to this, um, because, you know, China in my mind back then was like, well, there's tanks, the government's like running people over with tanks and beating people in the streets. And so I started talking to people in China, and I, I got the opportunity to go there. And it was this uh, this big thing. It was kind of scary, you know, because I didn't know what to expect. Again, I'm thinking of like tanks driving around, smashing people, and which is ridiculous, you know. <laughs> it's just ridiculous now now that I look back on it. But anyway, I got the opportunity to go, and I I went to Beijing, and I uh, was completely unprepared for what I experienced. It wasn't bad. It was incredible. I I went there, and the first thing I noticed was there were more people than I'd ever seen in my entire life just sitting on the side of the road out at night. You know, I'd arrived and, you know, I go out and there's just all this stuff going on everywhere. It's like an overload, you know, of things happening. And I, I noticed there wasn't people being smashed. There was none of that. In fact, there was a lot of the things that I was familiar with everywhere. There's like advertisements for cell phones and Different things back then, the big phone was the Razor phone from Motorola, if you remember those. Not the new one, but the the original Razor phone. That's how long ago that was. Gosh, was that 2006, 2007? Um, anyway, I I went to eat with, uh, with my friends, and they're like, okay, you know, here we have the shrimp. You uh, and these things with bones in it. I'd never had real Chinese food before. I just assumed that the stuff they had at the restaurant in America was... Chinese food. It turns out that General So's chicken and those kinds of things is not Chinese food. I don't know where that where it 
came about. I've heard that it came about from Taiwan, which I don't think is true either. Maybe some Taiwanese people in America cooking food for Americans came up with it, but uh, definitely not something that you'll find on the menu in China. I mean, they have a place, I think, in Shanghai that makes it for foreigners, but uh, for Chinese people, that's not what they eat. They eat incredibly spicy food for the most part, unless you're in the very far south. And anyway, yeah, in this case, I'm in this restaurant and there's, you know, the shells on the shrimp and bones in the food. And my thought is to take a napkin and, you know, put it in a napkin or something. And they're like, look, just just put it on the table, just spit it on the table. You, you get the meat off and then you spit it on the table or the floor. And I'm thinking like you know, my Western table manners, I can't do that. I, there's no way I can spit at this restaurant on the table. That, that would be completely wrong. And even though they were doing it, they're telling me to do it. I just, for whatever reason, it was very difficult. To, uh, probably one of the hardest things for me to get used to was the, the idea of taking bones and stuff that I chewed food off of and putting it on the table. Um, I don't know why, but that was really a really, really hard thing. I guess because it's ingrained of like, you would never do that. If you went into the restaurant in America and started spitting stuff on the table, uh, somebody might have a problem with that. But uh, it was it was a very interesting experience, all on my first day being in China. And then, you know, just exploring. And again, I, I like I said, I discovered there's police. I see them. They're not hitting people. They're not doing anything. I'm not saying that this stuff doesn't happen, just that, you know... It wasn't like all the cops were looking for, you know, that opportunity to just start busting people in the face. Uh, there weren't tanks running around. There was an, a time when I saw some soldiers. You know, I was in Beijing. So if you're up early enough in the morning and you happen to be where Tiananmen Square is, you know, they stop all the cars and the guys come out and put the flag up. I saw that while I was on a bus. That was kind of interesting. But I, I tr started traveling around in China. And I actually made several trips out there, um, went all over the place. There was one point where I took a, a train. This was back before the, the bullet train was really widespread. Took a train across China for five days to go to Yunnan province, which if you've been following me, I was there not too long ago in Yunnan province. But uh, what an experience that was. Just seeing all across China, you know, it was just slow. It was a really, really interesting thing. Seeing a completely different part of the country, um, yeah, it just opened up, I guess, my mind even further. So eventually, I, like I said, I kept going back for longer and longer, several months at a time, then longer and longer, even thinking of, you know, staying there. But eventually I did come back to the United States and I went back to, to working and, you know, this would be... 2008, which if you know the uh, the financial crash of 2008, the economy was not good. My job went away. Um, that was a really, really horrible experience. They gave me a week's worth of pay and said good luck, basically. And anyway, I struggled for a time in the United States trying to do jobs. And I, I reached a point where my car got smashed in this car accident. And that was it. That was the turning point. I just remember thinking like this, this sucks. I, I can't get ahead. Um, I'm struggling to survive here despite everything that I do. My, uh, my job is gone. Every job I get seems to go away. It's going to Mexico. It's going somewhere else. And then the car on top of all that. And I'm like, you know what? That's it. So I started looking online for work outside of the country because I, you know, that's the thing that you should do. You can't find work in the country. I might as well look outside the country. And I happened upon some work in China and I thought, you know, well, uh, what the heck? I, uh, you know, I loved it all the time that I was there. This is the perfect opportunity. And the rest is history. I ended up going to China and stayed there a long time. Uh, my, my son was born there. I've lived in Beijing, Shanghai, uh, some in uh, the south, Fujian province, and uh, most of it, of course, my connections with the middle of the country and Anhui province, uh, around the capital there, Hefei, and just built a life and eventually ended up with our own business over there at the very end toward COVID times. And that's how I became an expat. And all of the experiences that followed, that's what it's from. I, I'm sure that you wonder now, even if you knew what it meant to be an expat before I, I did this little thing and told you it meant someone that lived abroad. Um, 
yeah, that's how I became an expat. And that's why I have that, uh, the American expat. It's because I <laughs> lived abroad for all that time. I mean, I've done some uh, short stints living in France. We still have a place over there in France. Um, I, I am very much drawn to Asia. I, I don't know, being in Europe, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. But I just, um, it's too familiar, I guess. Well, I say that, and yet uh, China has become so familiar to me. It's almost like my other home, where uh, it, sometimes it's more normal to me than being in the United States, especially since coming back and finding the United States so <clears throat> so different from what it used to be before I left. But um, yeah, what what an experience it's been. The uh, the places I've seen, the people I've met, and things that I've learned that I never would have learned otherwise had it not been for those early experiences with uh, with the church that I grew up in and where it all led. I'm sure that nobody could have anticipated that it would lead there. Going to California would lead to going and living abroad, becoming an expat, um, my, my son, my family, my connections to other parts of the world. It's just, uh, it's been an incredible experience. And I uh, I often think of China. I would love to be back over there many times. I know that it's a, a complicated situation between the United States and China, the Western world and China. But um, I, I don't look at it from that perspective. I don't look at the uh, geopolitical stuff. I do sometimes because, you know, it comes up in the news, especially when I'm here in the United States and paying attention to it, which is bad for your mental health by the way stay away from all of that it, it's it's bad stuff all the politics here in the united states have gotten so crazy it's kind of nice to go elsewhere and not think about it for a while but uh yeah maybe uh maybe you know you, you start to worry a little bit there were some uh, some bad experiences there with the covid uh covid days which led uh, to coming back to the united states but um yeah that's where the whole expat thing came from now starting this channel that also started in China. I had a friend who had gotten involved with a school over there working uh, at this little English training center place, and they basically ripped him off. And, you know, he told me what had happened to him. Like, I went there and they told me, basically, they would open up a bank account for me. They would get me a cell phone. They would, you know, do everything for me, and they would hold my documents once I got there, like my passport and stuff. And uh, <laughs> when he told me that, I couldn't believe, like, no wonder you got ripped off, you know? You you don't even, it's not even your bank account. You, it's not your cell phone. You basically have nothing, and they have your, your travel documents to hold his ransom, which is what they did to him. They, like, held his, his passport and were telling him, like, look, you're going to pay us this they they made up some kind of situation where like the parents weren't happy with his class or something like that so he had to pay them money in order to get his documents back and be able to go work somewhere else which was ridiculous so anyway when he told me i'm like well what were you thinking you know i would never let someone hold my passport there's no way i would never let someone open a bank account for me that's my you know i'm going to have my own bank account which you can do if you live in china it's not you know, something you can't do, but you know, if somebody's coming over fresh and they have no idea and some, you know, every place is going to have BS people and con artists that'll rip you off. Anyway, he's like, Hey, why don't you make a YouTube channel or something and start telling people how to avoid these problems so that they don't run into it. So anyway, I started the YouTube channel, the American expat with that in mind that I would talk about life abroad and how to avoid some of those pitfalls and then COVID came along and it evolved into, well, whatever this is. It just uh, took a completely different direction. But that's where it was starting was to try and help people avoid some of those pitfalls. It's almost irrelevant at this point because, uh, well, there's not a lot of people going to China for work anymore. The the people that were going, I mean, when I first went to China, it was originally like um, engineers and business people going into China. And then it changed, you know, China kind of took off and they had their own engineers and their own people over there. And then it became just these people going over to teach English. And there's a lot of foreigners in China teaching English. But since COVID, that's kind of gone away. They The government changed some rules and that industry has kind of dried up. I think there's still 
some of those uh, little schools around. So there's probably still some people who are looking to go over there, but uh, probably not uh, the best. I, I guess it's still valid. It's similar. Like if you were going to go to Thailand or somewhere else to teach, you would have the same lessons. Like, no, you need to keep your documents. Don't give them to some stranger and trust them with your very important documents, you know, that you need to be able to get out of the country or to get home or whatever. Or to even open a bank account or get a cell phone. that You can't do anything on your own if you don't have that. But, um, yeah, that's that's how the channel started. And it just took a really strange direction, if you ask me. Coming back to the United States, going to uh, getting caught up in the whole news stuff, the social media, all the craziness that's been happening, Donald Trump and everything else, uh, Joe Biden... It's just been a wild time, as far as I can tell. The country is completely different than what it used to be. Hopefully, uh, we can get our senses back. <laughs> I think it's social media that's driving people insane. It just get off of the social media stuff. Anyway, that's that's kind of the story of how this all started. I, I, I do this because I know there's a lot of people that are getting on here that have no idea what the American expat is or how we, we came about. There, there's a sort of a disconnect, I think, with... Uh, who we are and what it stands for. And, uh, yeah, I thought I'd bring you up to speed. And let's see, I've been talking for uh, about 25 minutes on this, so I probably better stop, especially since I'm feeling a bit under the weather today anyway. Yeah, I better stop this. Hopefully you enjoyed that uh, little bit of reminiscing and talking about how we got here. And I guess uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. ไปพวงลงเฝ้าสาวเจ้าบางประคงห่างไว้งงหลงเกิน